Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Matt Ricker here at North Carolina State University. And we're in the middle of the North Carolina Piedmont, which are the rolling foothills of the mountains. So if you look around our landscapes here in the Piedmont, we have basically what we call a catena, where we go from high on the landscape to low on the landscape. And along that catena, we have predictable parent materials. So if you look up the hill from where we're at right now, we basically have our shoulder and our summit positions, which is where residual soils are, soils that form down through geologic weathering into the underlying rock. Where we're standing right now on the landscape, this is a backslope. And so as you get lower on the landscape, material moves by gravity, we call this colluvium. So where we're standing right now has colluvium over residuum. And we're gonna walk down into the woods and talk about alluvial soils, or those soils that form from water deposits. And the distinguishing characteristics of those soils relative to the ones up here. So we're going to walk down and take a look. Welcome to the floodplain. Uh, as you can see we have running water we have cut banks, we have point bars, all of what we call alluvial soil system or fluvial processes here. And so the soils that form here are very unique and we're going to talk about some of the ways that you know you have alluvium versus colluvium and residuum, focusing obviously on the active floodplain here today. So here's the soil we'll be looking at here in a moment. There's three things we want to key in on if we're thinking that a soil is an alluvial soil. In a case like this, we're right next to the stream. In large river systems, you might be three or four miles from the active stream channel. And one of the major things that we look for if we're thinking that it's been moved by water or these materials are alluvium, is we look at the coarse fragments or the gravels and channers. And the big thing that separates alluvium from colluvium, which are both moved materials, is that alluvial materials tend to be rounded. So something like this is a well-rounded coarse fragment. And in my hand, I have various rounded fragments. The rounded edges are basically this material rolling on the bed during flood events and through the process of abrasion, rounding out the corners. So all these rocks are banging into each other and basically rounding the, the edges. But if you look around the stream, you'll see there's a lot of coarse fragments in the bed here, or the bed load. And this is a function of the finer materials which are easier to move by water being flushed out of the channel here. So it leaves behind all the coarse the sand and these gravels. And a lot of these gravels aren't rounded yet. And the reason being, this is a really small stream. This is a first order stream, not enough energy and not enough distance to fully round all these coarse fragments. So what other features might we be looking for to know if we have alluvium versus colluvium? So we're looking at the coarse fragments, our proximity to a stream, we're looking at our landscape position, is it flat in the floodplain? And then if you cut a, a bank like this and you want to look at sort of the morphology, some things really stick out to us. The first is a process called stratification. And stratification is basically where the water of different energies is moving progressively larger or smaller particles depending on how much energy that flood had. And so in the upper part of this soil profile we can see pretty good examples of stratification. And so you can see these lenses through here of coarse sand intermixed with these finer silts or loamy material. So we basically have sands, loamy material, sands, loamy material, sands, and then it gets really fine and then coarse again. This is basically stratification. And so what's happening is it's a high energy flood, you get the sands, it's a low energy uh, period, you get the loamier materials, which are finer materials. So this is classic stratification. It's different sizes are sorted by water. The other thing you wanna look for in these types of soils and is not always present, but is obviously probably one of the most striking features of this soil is buried surfaces. So alluvial soils form from constant deposition or episodic flood, flood events. So a soil will, will form, form a nice A horizon, and then it'll flood and bury that A horizon, which will be preserved. And you can see here, we basically have 
an old soil on the bottom. This is the old surface, the old A. We call it AB. And then a bunch of material was deposited on top. And then right through here, you can see it's very dark again. There's a much thinner zone here of, an, of another buried surface. And then obviously at the modern surface, we have another A horizon. So this soil has three A horizons, two of which have been buried. This is a very common morphology to see stratification and dark layers or buried surfaces uh, within our alluvial soils. These are young soils. Alluvial soils tend to be relatively young. In the Piedmont region in North Carolina, mm -hmm. maybe 10 to 20,000 years is the oldest. You'll see a, a soil on this landscape position, whereas opposed to the uplands, you could be talking millions of years of soil development. And we can talk a little bit about horizons here and sort of what horizon designations we have as far as the morphology. And it gets pretty complex because of this burial process. So obviously at the surface here, looking at the tape, the upper five centimeters is the A horizon. It's a thin A horizon. It hasn't been plowed down here. And you can see hanging off the roots, we have our nice granular structure, granular structure. So we have a nice little thin A horizon. And then from five centimeters down to about 43 centimeters, we have this highly stratified layer. And I would call this probably a, just a sea horizon. It's alluvium that basically washed in here. And you see sort of these irregular curvy shapes indicating likely turbid flow. Um, so this was a large scale event that just mixed all this material up and deposited it here. Um, so I'd call this a sea horizon. So we have an A and a C. And then you see here it gets much more loamy, much finer material and much darker in color. And so this is our first actually buried genetic horizon, we call an AB, so a capital A, a little B. And that extends from 43 to 61 centimeters on the tape. And basically this is a, a former surface that was stable for a period of time and built up organic matter or humus, and then was buried by this material on top. And then moving down, I would just lump this entire horizon here which is all kinds of different material, but they're stratified again, similar to above. So here we have extreme stratification of really fine materials. This is probably like a clay loam or silty clay loam and our sands. And you can see here this, this thin little sand lens sort of with a, a, basically it has a wavy boundary, but then it's broken. So that, that boundary disappears again, showing you that you had turbid flow. So I call this another sea horizon, but because we have a sea horizon up here, and we have a sea down here, we'd also have to look at color. You do see a lot of redox amorphic features in here. We could put the subscript G on this, uh, gray because of wetness. So, And then below that, you see this really striking feature, probably the darkest feature in the entire uh, soil here. This is the pre-colonial, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. This material on top is very young. It's probably 200 years old. Uh, this material down below is probably possibly tens of thousands of years old. And so here we have a stable soil that existed on the landscape before Europeans colonized. And so this is European sediment here from, from agriculture in the basin. This is the pre-colonial surface. Since we called an AB up here, we're going to have another AB, but we have to put a prime on it. So it's an A prime B down here. And this is extending down to about 107 centimeters here. And then below that, you see a lot more gray colors and a lot more redox amorphic concentrations as both soft masses and as poor linings along the edges of where the roots, where root channels used to be. Very striking features. Uh, these are BG horizons, but because they're underneath all this material on top, we have to put a B indicating that they're genetic horizons that were buried. So these are BG, BGB horizons. Another feature you'll see here, probably from crayfish, what we call crotovina. So the crayfish, this would have been the original surface up here. They burrow through the surface and they bring that A material down into the BGs. Very common, called crotovinas. And you'll see these very commonly in wetlands in the southeast. And then at the very bottom, 
is basically a, another CG horizon. Uh, we know it's a CG, it's structural, it's massive, it's got a lot of coarse fragments in it. Um, and you can hear that over here. Sometimes these are called basal gravels, they're the largest um, uh, size fraction, and they're at the base of many of the soils around here. And so, morphologically very complex, but a very young soil. Uh, this would likely classify, because of the depth of this buried soil down here, this will classify as an entosol. If we remove the material from the top, uh, the old soil below would have classified as an inceptosol. So technically you have two soils stacked on each other. One is, is derived from anthropogenic sediments, the other is more of a naturally occurring. Uh, and some folks will put a lithologic discontinuity because of the age difference. So the material above my knife is 300 years old maximum, which is from European colonization and erosion down into this uh, little floodplain. And below that is the Holocene age soil, 10,000 plus years of soil development. And so we'd call this, a, even though all this is alluvium, uh, in some cases we'll call this, if it's, if it's obvious, a second parent material because of difference in age. And so that's our complex alluvial soil. Let's talk about interpretations. So for something like septic or building houses, building roads, uh, even doing cropping or anything of that nature, any type of engineering or agronomic um, aspect to the land down here, because of the flooding, which is either rare to frequent in a site like this, you're basically going to have a lot of impairments. You're going to have a lot of severe interpretations. That doesn't mean that these soils are not useful. And one of the major things that we've been looking at in research on soils like this is their ability to store carbon, which is a very important um, ecosystem service provided by soils. And so relative to a soil in an upland around here that just has one A horizon, we have three A horizons. And so this A horizon in particular is very thick and, and probably has a much higher carbon pool than the ones above it. And so the, the overall carbon storage potential of a site like this is much higher than an upland which just gets leaf litter additions and root additions at the surface. Here we form an A and then we bury it and preserve it for long periods of time and we bury and preserve it. So the uh, carbon pools in a spot like this can be anywhere to, from two to five times what they are just in a contiguous upland. And then because you have this stratification of high carbon materials, this actually acts kind of like a filter. So one of the major recognized ecosystem services provided by riparian zones like this, especially those on the edge of farm fields like we have directly above us right now, is the fact that nitrate, which is formed in an aerobic soil uh, on these farm fields, is then water soluble and it'll move with the groundwater to the low part of the landscape. And as that groundwater discharges out into the stream, it basically becomes a water quality impairment. So you have high, high nitrate loads, and that's very uh, bioavailable, it's very uh, plant available. It'll lead to algal blooms and water quality issues. These stratified layers, when they interact with nitrate, which may be coming through the groundwater in the spring, for example, uh, if it's anaerobic here and you have a carbon source, this carbon source drives denitrification. And actually sites like this are ideal on the edge of, of farm fields for removing nitrate. And they're very efficient at doing it because of the carbon stratification at depth. And so a soil like this would be well preferred over a soil that didn't have these buried carbon rich materials at depth because of the potential for denitrification and removal of nitrate before it gets into the stream system itself. So these sites are disproportionately high in what we call ecosystem services just a couple of them right there, carbon storage potential and denitrification. Cut. 
cut. 